Um, with all of that, I want to um, ask that you join me in welcoming uh, Professor and Fletcher Jones Chair in Literature at LMU, um, uh, uh, Professor Ruben Martinez. Um, prior to his appointment here at LMU, um, Professor Martinez taught at the University of Houston's Creative Writing Program and the University of California, Santa Barbara, and uh, Claremont McKenna College. Um, we are especially delighted uh, to have him here with us tonight. Uh, because his work resonates not only with scholars, but just as importantly, um, the broader community. And um, that's such an important part of LMU's mission. Uh, in many ways, Professor Martinez needs no introduction, um, as his prolific record as a journalist, performer, and teacher speaks for itself. Um, his award-winning work has appeared uh, in the New York Times, Washington Post, Salon, Village Voice, Mother Jones, and a whole litany of other um, fabulous publications, and um, his work has earned him a number of um, uh, awards, including a Lennon Foundation Fellowship, um, as well as a Lowe Fellowship from Harvard University's Graduate School of Design, and my per personal favorite, a Freedom of Information Award from the ACLU. <laughs> <laughs> and um, he's also won a little thing called an Emmy for his work on KCET, uh, KCT's A Life and Time. Times. Um, so tonight, he's joining us to speak about one of his more recent projects, uh, Desert America, uh, Boom or Bust, uh, in, in the New Old West. And for those of us who are immigrants, uh, it's really a, an incredibly beautiful book uh, to read. But I, have, I suspect that for Native Californians, uh, uh, there, there's, some, um, there's a lot of resonance there as well. Um, about this work, a reviewer in Publishers Weekly has remarked, um, that Martinez offers reportage beyond the simple binaries of the immigration issue or the drug war. He delivers a lively, compassionate intervention into our collective conception of the Southwest. This thoughtful and well-written account intimately explores the convolutions of racism and class conflict that have come to define a divided America. I think with the fact that the elections just happened recently that this is such a timely topic. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to the man who needs no real introduction, um, gone on too long. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, and, uh, and, and thanks to Dean Brangolini, uh, and especially to Jeremy Haslip for uh, guiding me in today. <laughs> I, 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 I flew in. I've been spending a lot of time in Northern California because uh, my family is split between the two uh, uh, places right now. And uh, I, I flew in today. My, my flight was canceled in the morning. And, 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 but I still got here with what I thought was plenty of time, and I gave myself two hours to cross town. <laughs> and it was barely enough, and I had to get off the 110 freeway, and uh, Jimmy Hazlitt was kind enough to do a Google traffic search. And he <laughs> put me on a route that I had no idea that Florence kind of like curly cued around yeah. in this really interesting way on the far west side. I'm, I'm very, very keen on Florence. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you uh, for coming tonight. Um, it's, it's such a beautiful night, the, the way the colors were, were darkening on, on the water. I'm, I'm very conscious of being next to that huge, uh, vast otherness that is the ocean. And, uh, and uh, a lot of people have, you know, critics, uh, philosophers, um, uh, uh, people, you know, uh, uh, obsessed with the natural world and, and the, the interface with, with the human one, uh, have remarked about similarities between the ocean and the desert. Uh, these vast stretches of, of really uh, otherly landscape that are so radically different from most of the uh, inhabited uh, realm uh, that, uh, that we humans occupy. Um, and so on the border between the vast otherness of the ocean and the vast otherness of the desert, we live here in Los Angeles. Uh, I grew up, uh, grew up here, was born and raised in the city. I'm um, son and grandson of immigrants from Mexico and El Salvador. El Salvador is a long way from the desert. I spent a good time, a good part of my childhood there, uh, and uh, cut my teeth as, as a journalist there when I was a young uh, man. But the desert <clears throat> was always part of my, my family's uh, uh, personal mythology, uh, particularly on my father on the father's side of my family. Uh, uh, both my uh, grandparents were from northern uh, Mexican towns, uh, Jerez, Zacatecas, and uh, and um, uh, in Coahuila also, where my grandfather was from. So uh, my father uh, kept on dragging us back into the desert, not, not all the way down to Coahuila or Zacatecas when we were growing up, 
but to shoestring family vacations in uh, the far reaches of the Coachella Valley. Uh, uh, we, we never did do a vacation on the Strip in Palm Springs. That was way too expensive for my father, child of the Great Depression, as he always reminds us. Um, uh, so he would go, uh, he would drag us to Indio in, in, in yeah. August <laughs> for the off-season motel rates. Um, but it was really quite a magical experience when I was growing up, 10, 11 years old. You'd be out there, and uh, uh, my father would upend our normal routine, our clock. We would be splashing around in the swimming pool at midnight. Uh, and so it was, it was this place where experience, where landscape, where time... Uh, was, was completely, radically different than uh, the, the space that we occupied in the city. Uh, and, of course, we made the de rigueur uh, expedition to the Grand Canyon, to the Painted Desert. Um, and those were uh, uh, the, my, my, my first experiences of, of the desert as I was growing up, uh, actually being on that landscape. But I actually imagined it before I was on it. Um, probably my first glimpse of the desert was in my grandparents' living room, uh, in the very leafy green space of Silver Lake, the, the neighborhood, uh, which has recently been rebranded as Hipster Paradise, of course. Uh, but uh, when I was growing up there, it was, it was you know, a motley collection of Italian Americans and French and British and, and my grandparents, the Mexican immigrants. Um, and th they, they lived in a wonderful old house built in the late 20s, as most of the houses in that area are. Um, with a lot of deco flourishes, including a lot of uh, stained glass windows, beautiful stained glass windows. And the living room was the, the biggest one of all, the picture window that looked out on the street. And uh, the, the center pane was a desert scene. Uh, and it glowed beautifully, uh, depending on the time of day, sometimes like a silvery tone in the, in, 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 in the morning as, as the dawn was coming, and, and then much more blue hues. Uh, when the sun was setting in the evening, uh, uh, the scene looked out across a sandy plain, and there was uh, cacti uh, and, and mountains in the distance, and there was no human figure whatsoever. It was just, you know, just distance and a bit of elevation and a little bit of flora, no fauna. Um, and there was one other desert scene in that house, which was actually uh, just a room away from, uh, so in the part of the living room is the stained glass window, and in the entryway, there's a little diorama that my grandparents bought somewhere. No one's ever told me where, where but a quite magical little piece, about this size, like a little you know, mini TV screen. Um, and it was an actual diorama, three-dimensional. Uh, once again, a desert vista, looking out across a sandy plain. Uh, and uh, it was a western sunset. Uh, saguaro cacti, silhouetted against orange and green and turquoise, you know, kind of like this, this palette of colors you know, going up into a, a deep blue at the top of the, the, the scene. And that particular uh, 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 landscape really, really um, captured my imagination. I, it's, it's one of my earliest memories, gazing upon it and, and reaching towards it and asking my grandparents to pick me up and put me nearer to it. So I imagined the desert, or the desert was represented for me long before I was actually on it. The final piece of, of imagined desert uh, uh, was my father's ushering me into the desert through Hollywood. <laughs> like most Mexican-Americans of his generation, he was a good Cowboys and Indians kid, raised on the Western. Uh, he actually was raised on the Western on both sides of the border. Because Hollywood, of course, was global, long before we heard the term, term globalization. And uh, when, even when he was living in Mexico City, he was screening John Ford Westerns, <laughs> you know, uh, eating popcorn in a theater in Mexico City and seeing John Wayne in, in The Searchers, for example, which was my father, still is my father's favorite Western. He hates John Wayne, and he hates the John Wayne character. <laughs> and he sides with the half-breed character, <laughs> that, 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 that Hunter. Uh, and, uh, and so I was, very early on, there was all these kind of markers for me setting up what would become uh, a more conscious uh, experience of the desert as, as I became an, an adult. Um, uh, now, my childhood memories were, were rather idyllic, as, as I've said, um, and, and nothing could have quite prepared me for how complicated the landscape that I ended up living on uh, would, would become um, as when I finally got there. The circumstances which led me to live in the desert uh, were pers very uh, dark personal ones. Uh, I, in 1997, I was lucky enough to have a book contract 
they had things like that in, in the 1990s. <laughs> You've just heard that the Random House and Penguin have now merged, and, and there's a front page story in the New York Times today about you know, the publishing industry. This, this being the ultimate sign of the publishing industry, just like, you know, in uh, total collapse now. Um, but I was lucky enough to have gotten a New York book contract, with an advance, even, and, uh, and I went to Mexico City because I, the book I pitched was about, about immigration from Mexico to the United States. And uh, I said, well, I was going to live in Mexico for a year in research and, and uh, uh, you know, tell the story of the origins of, of Mexican migration to the United States. <coughs> well, I'm not the first writer to, to tell this sad tale, but uh, a year into my research, I had spent all the money. Mm. I didn't have a single word written. <laughs> and I was in dire personal straits. Um, I uh, had a drug problem. Uh, I write about this in the book. The book is part of the memoir. And uh, I'm alone and broke and howling in Mexico City, the most populous place on earth. And uh, I destroyed most of my personal relationships at that point, as addicts are wont to do. And I called the person, one of the, the few friends that I could count on at, at that point in my life. Uh, her name is Elia Arce, a wonderful uh, performance artist and uh, writer from Costa Rica. Uh, and she happened to be living in the village of Joshua Tree, California, mm -hmm. part of a little fledgling uh, art colony. Uh, they wouldn't have called it that at that point. Uh, Elia was just part of a group of very, very, very low rent, uh, boho, uh, you know, uh, uh, outsider artists um, who had forsaken the city for an experiment in quasi-communal living out in the desert. And they were not the first people <laughs> to do so. As uh, over the years I've learned, people have been heading out into the desert on pilgrimages of various kinds for millennia. Uh, and, uh, my, my good friend Doug, Doug Christie is not here tonight, but uh, we teach a course uh, called Into the Desert Together, an interdisciplinary course. And he goes on and on about the, the monks of the fourth century mm. forsaking the Nile River Valley. And, and they were kind of like the, the hippies of their day, you know, tuning in, dropping out, and turning on out in the desert. Um, so my friend Elia and a few uh, creative types, <coughs> not creative class types, because they had no class, they had no money, uh, um, went, uh, went out to the desert because it was cheap at that time. It's not quite so cheap today, which is part of the story of, of Desert America. And I called her... I told her the, my sad tale, and she said, Ruben, in her inimitable Costa Rican inflected Spanish, Ruben, ven de para acá. <laughs> so I went, para allá. Uh, and they helped me get back on my feet. I found a shack in the sand, dilapidated, facing west. The windows were opaque from the sand, having pecked away at them with uh, the, the western wind for, you know, 50 years. And uh, uh, the place was a two-bedroom shack uh, on five acres, and I rented it for $200 a month. Such were the deals in uh, the Mojave Desert uh, back at the end of the, the 1990s before the real estate bomb. Uh, and there I started writing uh, very slowly, and that's really where this book begins. Um, nothing, as I say, could have prepared me for just how complicated the landscape, my experience of the landscape and the landscape would, would, would become in the ensuing years. Because when I first arrived there, I said, well, this is the perfect place to be. Uh, uh, here I'll get clean. Here I'll, I'll get back on my feet. I'll, I'll start writing. And I'll hike in the desert. Like, you know, I kind of felt like Harry Dean Stanton, if any, anyone ever saw the, the, the wonderful Europop desert of uh, Ben Bender's Paris, Texas. Mm -hmm. uh, I was like Harry Dean Stanton. I, I, you know, I was going to walk out into the desert and, and, and find myself. Um, and I did, but I also quickly realized that I wasn't the only person going out there fleeing and howling from the demons, the city demons, the city, the city demons. Um, the Marines were all around me. Uh, they were dropping ordnance on the sand about, you know, 15 miles away at the, the biggest uh, Marine Corps training facility in the United States, the Marine Corps Air and Ground Combat Center in 29 Palms. My, uh, the windows of my shack rattled with the detonations, and there would be flares, you know, coming down very slowly over the ridges at night. And, uh, this is before, this is after the, the first Gulf War, and right before the second, of course. So um, they were training. It was a that desert was a simulacrum.
for the desert of the Middle East. Uh, the, my neighbors, uh, were many of them were Marines, uh, who were howling and bringing with them ghosts, uh, bringing with them ghosts from their tours of duty. Uh, they would uh, drive down the road in the middle of the night in drunken rage. They would uh, shoot automatics into the air. The bullets would ricochet past my windows. Uh, there were some encounters with my neighbors. Not all of them were, were peaceful. Um, one time my, my door was knocked off its hinges um, by one of my neighbors. Um, my dog ultimately ended up saving us. Um, so the, the, this, this dark, very dark desert presented it to me um, slowly but surely over the time that I was in 29 Palms. And from there, I was hooked on the desert. I, um, uh, and over the next 10 years, I would live primarily in the desert. A few years later, my next stop was northern New Mexico. I had got my life together enough to have fallen in love and convinced the woman that I was going to marry that I was you know, clean and uh, getting my life back together. Uh, and Angela Garcia uh, was an anthropology student uh, at Harvard University and uh, looking to do her dissertation research on heroin addiction in the uh, Española Valley of northern New Mexico, which is an enchanted, beautiful, desert-like landscape. Uh, and uh, when she said, do uh, you want to live with me up there you know, while I do my research? I said, yes. And immediately I forgot that it was heroin addiction that she was researching. Because all I heard was northern New Mexico. Mm. Oh, yeah, I've been there. Taos, Santa Fe, you know, the, 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 those uh, wonderful buttes and mesas and the strata, you know, the, the, sh the dusty shades of pink and yellow and beige and uh, red. Uh, uh, that landscape that's been painted and imagined for us by generations of artists from the, the great Taos and Santa Fe art colonies of the early 20th century all the way across the 20th century in literature and uh, John Nichols all over Lafarge. I mean, you know, it's been imagined for us again and again and again, uh, mostly in a very romantic uh, uh, way. Uh, uh, and most of those representations, especially the, the, the painterly ones, were a variation if, much more technically proficient, but a variation of those very early representations that I saw in my grandparents' house, mm -hmm. they were landscapes. There were no human figures on those landscapes. Uh, which is very curious to me. Because as I got to know the desert, there was no empty space. I mean, I yearned for empty space. I think that's what most of us go out to the desert for. We go out there to, once again, to, to disconnect, right, from city life, from the, the, that, that, that populated place. We want to encounter ourselves, you know, just out in, uh, with, with the wind and, and with the elements on the land, an encounter, you know, with spirit on the land. But everywhere that I went, I was confronted with the human other, and uh, often as not, that human other was in very, very, very difficult circumstances. So Angela and I arrive in northern New Mexico uh, on this landscape that uh, I knew uh, from, its, from its artistic representations. And as I say, Angela's dissertation topic had somehow receded to the back of my head. <laughs> I was reading D.H. Lawrence. I was reading about D.H. Lawrence and uh, Frida Lawrence hanging out uh, you know, with Mabel Dodge Luhan in Taos in the 1920s. Uh, I was baking bread for the first time in my life. I was chopping wood. I was uh, hiking with my dog up on the buttes and the mesas. And I would come home and Angela would tell me about her day at the detox clinic. And so it was this very uneasy dichotomy. Um, I'm, I'm going to read to you a section from uh, early on in the book where Angela and I have pretty much just, just arrived in northern New Mexico and uh, relieve us of whatever uh, final bits of romantic uh, notions uh, remained. Um, this is uh, from a, a chapter called Mornings in New Mexico, uh, which is a variation of the title of one of D.H. Lawrence's books, uh, Mornings in Mexico. And uh, Lawrence had lived on this landscape uh, al almost 100 years before me, and um, that's where the title comes from. You'll forgive uh, some vulgarity, uh, which actually begins with the first line. <laughs> Get the fuck out of here. Sunday afternoon. For the past hour, screaming and crying, fists pounding on a car hood, 
screen door slamming, and in the midst of the battle, a small boy talking to himself in a make-believe game. I said, I want you out of here. These are my neighbors. Rose Garcia and Jose Martinez, a couple, both 23 years old. Their boy is perhaps five. She is light-skinned with thick black hair that she teases up in front, old-school Chicana style. She is somewhat pear-shaped, and what's striking about her body is the constant tension, blunt as a hammer. She almost always wears t-shirts and pants and flip-flops. Jose Martinez is short and wiry. He wears his baseball caps backward, triple X white t-shirts, and during the summer, shorts and tennis shoes. I have never seen him without his head covered. I rarely hear his voice, even though the courtyard in front of the house sound, somehow acts as a megaphone so that the southern end of the village can listen in on everything. It's almost always Rose's screams we hear. The fights occur a couple of times a week. I'm in the attic. I've made my writing space next to the window that looks out toward Joe Rendon's trailer. The Rendon family live on the other side of our house, um, and we came to refer to the Rendones as our good neighbors. <laughs> <laughs> There's Joe Rendon's trailer and the Juniper Hills beyond the highway. The, this is kind of like the foothills of the San Rio de Cristo Mountains. I've taken one of the old heavy doors stored in the garage and propped it up on soft horses. The door probably hung in one of the original bedrooms downstairs. It is now my writing desk. We're living in a bona fide uh, northern New Mexico adobe, about 125 years old, peaked roof, tin, thick brown adobe walls, 24 inches thick. You took my mota! She's accusing him of stealing her marijuana. I didn't take your mota, bitch! When I hear the screams, I edge up to the window at the other end of the attic where Angela writes and where I have a direct view of Rose and Jose's. I'm careful to remain in shadow, although I doubt my neighbors can see me given the angle and the distance. In any case, they are too deep in their moment to look across the courtyard and up to the tiny window of their neighbor's attic. Sometimes Angela joins me. I kneel by the window and she stands. Or I sit in the rocking chair, and she sits on the floor and rests her chin on an arm she supports on the windowsill. We stay for as long as the fight lasts. <coughs> he jumps into his car and drives off in a cloud of dust. Only rarely does she drive off. Upon his return, it'll start up again, muffled shouting from inside the house. A word, then a phrase, louder, closer <coughs> to the front door. The door opens, now coming at us full volume. Get the fuck out of my life. This is her most oft repeated line. She struts back inside again. The door slams. Now it is quiet in the courtyard and in the rest of the village. There was a late season freeze last night, but the sun has warmed the Española Valley. The local weather forecaster wrote that it was going to be a chamber of commerce day. <laughs> Flies buzz lazily in the yellow and green and blue of spring. I can hear the rhythmic whir of a few cicadas, the first of the year, coming up from the riverside. The river is the Rio Grande. It's about 300 yards from our house. There's the whoosh of cars up and down the highway, the distant thudding of locals taking target practice on the BLM land. We are surrounded by millions of acres of public land that once belonged to the ancestors of my neighbors. And suddenly, go to that little puta of yours. Her voice builds and crests in a shriek, which usually happens on the final word of a phrase like, Life, taking the vowel and bending it in several different directions before her breath runs out. She coughs. She coughs a lot. I hear it early in the morning, late at night. I hear it very clearly when she is sitting on the patio smoking a joint. It is quick and sharp, the throat clenching and tissue gritting deep inside her chest. Every once in a great while, he responds, but he never shouts as loudly as she does. Look at you, you're psycho, eh? <laughs> They are dealing. We have noticed the traffic. Perhaps, perhaps a dozen cars a day drive through. These customers are men, all Hispanos, as Northern Mexicans invariably refer to themselves, young and old, mostly in work trucks. Some will come early in the morning, apparently on their way to a trade job, plumbing, electrical. Others in the early evening, clearly after finishing work. Some in the middle of the day, some in the wee hours. It is Rose's house. The Garcias, and by the way, uh, our neighbors' last names, it's Jose Martinez and, and Rose Garcia, 
they mirror Angela and I's uh, last name. Hmm. Uh, it's Angela Garcia hmm. in the Benmore King. One member of the clan owns the nightclub in the village, another the fruit stand that's never open at the intersection of the highway with the Leiden Road. The Garcias, I'm told, are an old, connected family, so well-connected that our landlady passed on to us the advice she was given by local law enforcement when she suspected that Jose had stolen her lawnmower. We can't do anything to them, the cops told her. But if you want to take action on your own, shoot them, drag them into your house, and make it look like self-defense against a breaking and entering. <laughs> Get the fuck out of here, you fuck! Do it your pills. You think I'm fucked up? Look in the mirror. So Angela and I watch and listen through the screens on the attic windows. The journalist in me thinks, get close. Talk to them. Get close. This is what I tell my students, by the way, in my writing classes. Documentary intimacy, you know? Got to get close to your subject. Get all those telling details down. Get close. But we already are. <laughs> They're my neighbors. Rose is aware of our presence. During the first fight we witnessed, which occurred just a couple of weeks after our arrival, and which included Rose and another woman coming to blows on the patio, she screamed, I don't need this shit. I've got new neighbors. <laughs> Outsiders, I could imagine her calculating, perhaps even thinking of us as gringos. Angela drives a Subaru, and Ruben never leaves the house before 10 in the morning. <laughs> because class can trump race, and in New Mexico, race does not necessarily mean color. Over a period of months of adjusting to our arrival in Belarde, the name of the village we're in, Belarde, New Mexico, we come to an agreement, all of us. They won't get in our shit, and we won't get in theirs. Which means we must not feel compassion, or loathing, or fear. We must not feel anything for each other. Still, I go to the window. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when Joe Rendon, my other neighbor, when Do Joe Rendon and I talk across the fence, sometimes we'll discuss the latest eruption next door. He shakes his head. And Joe's young, but he talks like he's old, a man of tradition. He's always reminding me that the Rendones own the land all the way from the highway to the river. There were orchards and pasture, Joe says, cows and sheep, and there was good <coughs> snow every winter and good rain every summer. Oh yeah, there were fights, of course, and a lot of drinking, but not cocaine, not heroin, that's for sure. Now look at us. The sun dips below the Black Mesa. I should explain the Black Mesa. Uh, right along the riverside, west of the river in Villarde, there's uh, a, a Black Mesa. There's many Black Mesas across the southwest. Uh, this one's pretty dramatic. You know, there's a valley, the river, and then on the other side of the river, it just juts up, you know, almost straight up a thousand feet. Uh, you know, it's an uh, igneous feature, basalt. Um, very little vegetation on it. It's kind of like a volcanic exclamation mark on, on, on the landscape. And it's 11 miles long and 1,000 feet high, uh, which brings twilight in Berlade an hour earlier mm. than it does anywhere else. So by, you know, uh, 3 o'clock in, in December, it's, it's already darkening in Berlade. Um The sun dips below the Black Mesa, bringing Berlade's early twilight, twilight. Rose explodes one last time. I can't take it anymore. Now she shoots off in her red Chevy SUV. He stays behind with their son and putters around the yard. She returns in a few minutes, charging down the road in a dust cloud. She screams some more, goes back inside the house. At true dusk, when the last of the sunlight bleeds away from the eastern hills beyond the reach of the mesa's shadow and leaves them in a blue-gray pallor, I hear her screams once again. I'm making dinner now sauteing Italian sausage and boiling water for pasta. I walk upstairs to the window where I've spent the better part of the afternoon. <laughs> I can see the dome light inside Jose's small black sedan with the tinted windows. He's sitting inside listening to music that I can't hear. I eat dinner alone. Angela's on the graveyard shift at the detox clinic. On Turner Classic Movies, I watch A Night to Remember. <laughs> Gentlemen, you're in a precarious situation. <laughs> I go to the attic to write. I look out the back window one last time. The dome light in Jose's sedan is off now. A thin line of light seeps through the crack at the bottom of their front door. So that gives you a sense of uh, our arrival in, in Villar, that we lived there ultimately three years. 
and our relationship with our neighbors was always fraught. Ultimately, death came to our neighbor's house, actually to two of our neighbor's houses, um, both in the form of drug overdoses. Um, the uh, Española Valley of northern New Mexico is a uh, book point of a heroin epidemic in, in the desert southwest. Uh, Española, the town itself, has the high, highest rate of heroin addiction of any place in the United States, rural or urban. Mm -hmm. But when you go through that landscape, if, for example, you're driving from Santa Fe to Taos, there's two routes. You can go the high road and the low road. They're both beautiful. Uh, a lot of it is on the 68, which is the low road to Taos, uh, which goes pretty close uh, uh, alongside the, the, the Taos Gorge. So it's a spectacular landscape. Um, you actually can see a little bit of a lot of it as you're driving up the 68. It's, uh, to, it would be to your left as you're driving up. So what you would see is the, the peaked tin roofs of the adobes and apple orchards and the cottonwood uh, line of the river. What you would see, in other words, is classic southwestern American pastoral. Um, because it's a rural space, you're not going to see anybody outside. Death happens inside. Life happens inside, you know, except for going out to the fields. So uh, the, uh, these ghosts are, are hidden away from us um, by the rural landscape and also, I argue in the book, by our representations of landscape, artistic representations of, of landscape um, across uh, the period of uh, the colonizing of the southwestern United States. Um, the arrival of the Santa Fe and, and Taos art colonies uh, really begins this kind of representation in, in earnest. And uh, I've gotten into some discussions with, with, with people about this. It's, 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 it's a, uh, some people take it as a provocative point. And are they saying, well, are you saying that George O'Keefe is like some sort of reactionary, you know, uh, uh, figure that's erasing, uh, you know, uh, people from the landscape? Uh, my, my beef is not with George O'Keefe. <laughs> uh, George O'Keefe and Ernest Blumenschein and uh, Thomas Moran and uh, Marston Hartley, my personal favorite, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, are um, the greatest painters of their generation. Uh, their technical brilliance shimmers on those canvases. I want a Martin Hartley <laughs> hanging in my living room. If anybody's got a line into a cheap one, please let me know. <laughs> um, so the technical brilliance is there, and the landscapes are undeniably beautiful. But they also serve a purpose in terms of tourism, uh, and in terms of capital, and in terms of speculation. There's an unholy alliance into which artists, mostly unwittingly, entered into um, very early on. Some of them actually wittingly. Ernest Blumenschein, for example, uh, one of the great uh, Taos painters, uh, gave the uh, ATSF Railroad several canvases in exchange for passage out west. Those canvases ended up sitting in railway offices and were reproduced lithographically in the magazines of the time to draw people to the west. That's called colonization. Mm -hmm. So in this way, these uh, the technical brilliance and, 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 the, and the gaze upon uh, uh, landscape beauty were placed at the service of speculation. Uh, and they've been recycled again and again and again. And in this most recent boom period, which of course led to the crash that we're still in now, those very images were used to draw people west again. And people came to the west during this 10-year period that I cover in the book. Uh, in numbers that uh, are almost as great in terms, in pr proportionally speaking, uh, to the opening of the frontier. The last 10 years saw uh, an infusion of migrants into the interior west, many from the coastal cities. Many people coming from the coastal cities. Some of them priced out by gentrification in places like Los Angeles and the Bay Area, for example. Moving to Phoenix, Denver, Las Vegas, Albuquerque. Um, El Paso. Uh, but there was also a 1% migration into these areas. Uh, the gentry uh, bought up, bought and sold a land uh, on that same landscape. And so you had kind of like a cleaving in the American desert west 
that was reflective of the overall economy, uh, splitting radically, where the middle was dropping out, and opposite ends of the economy were actually the, the growth areas, poverty and exaggerated wealth. Um, in that uh, black hole between those poles, opposite poles of the economy, is where heroin and death comes. Um, and so ultimately, Desert America, I suppose the, the title is supposed to function several different ways, right? The desert of capitalism, for example. Um, the mess that we got ourselves into out there. The drug war that people don't want to see. I, I was very struck during the election season how the drug war was not mentioned a single time by anyone. And it's uh, portrayed as a war that's Mexico. It's Mexico's drug war. It's almost prefaced with, almost always prefaced with Mexico. It's Mexico's drug war. But we have financed it to the tune of $2 billion. And by all accounts, the more money is on the way for weapons to be used in that war, 80,000 dead. Um, but somehow it's not our war. It's theirs, uh, even though we're the ones that consume the drugs. And we arm uh, the, uh, the cartels with, with weapons. So desert in many, with many different meanings. But uh, uh, and uh, I'll finish my remarks with, with, with this. Um, all of this darkness on that landscape does not take away from the desert's beauty and the profound symbolism of desert as site of healing pilgrimage. Indeed, ultimately, the book serves as kind of a, um, a guidebook into trying to save that part of the desert which called to us in, from the beginning, which called the St. Anthony from what he saw as the decadence of the populated Nile River Valley and going off to do battle with the demons in his desert cell in the Tibalt of the Egyptian desert. That desert of pilgrimage is still there. And that desert of pilgrimage goes back millennia um, has the lesson of hospitality, the lesson of solidarity, which boils down to this. You can't survive in the desert without the knowledge of the people who know that land intimately. You can't survive a trek across the desert without Samaritans, without the oasis, without somebody uh, uh, being there at the moment when you run out of water. That symbolism, that symbolism of the desert stands. And that's ultimately what keeps bringing me back. Because for every moment I had out there, the meth lab exploding on the horizon, my neighbors, an overdose, uh, uh, the extreme poverty on the landscape hidden by the opulence on that landscape. Um, there is also signs of people resisting, of people imagining a better place, of people arriving in the desert um, innocently looking for that healing place, yearning for that other country, uh, which has deep roots in all our great spiritual traditions. The desert exists, if not in name, uh, certainly as symbol uh, and practice in all the great contemplative religions. And that brings me back to here, Loyola Marymount University, and my relationship with Doug Christie. He's gotten name checked twice tonight, I'll have to tell him. Um, <laughs> we'll I, tell him. Yeah. Um, uh, and, that, and the class that we teach together called Into the Desert, which has been approved for the core curriculum, uh, the new core, uh, <laughs> and uh, which is uh, a course where we braid together uh, these complicated deserts, where we talk about the mystical desert uh, of, of uh, Meister Eckert, uh, and we talk about the, 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 the desert of Juarez, of femicide, at the same time. And ultimately, we argue together. And by the way, he just received his new book. Uh, he's, he just published his new book, so we were on this pro in this process of... of, of he's one of our pub night speakers next semester. Yes. <laughs> yes. The, team. the Blue Sapphire of the Mind is the, the name of his book. Ultimately, what he and I are arguing together is that you can't, you can't have the mystical desert without dealing with the material desert. That the act of dropping out and tuning in out there amid the nothing... Um, is, is, not a, a, is, is not a complete gesture without confronting the material um, tragedy out in that desert today.
So I, I feel like the, the desert itself needs to be cleansed. Uh, there's blood on the sand right now. It's a particularly uh, fraught moment because of the drug war, because of the economic crisis, and the, and the way it's played itself out on the desert landscape in the United States. The foreclosure rate was the highest in the desert, in the desert west. The, crap, the unemployment rate was the highest in the desert west, Las Vegas. The growth rate of the population was the highest in the desert west of the last decade. The environmental concerns in the desert west, water, fracking, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, everything that is in crisis in the world is in crisis uh, even more so, I, I, I would argue, in, in, on this landscape, precisely because it is so fragile. The desert is a beautiful and fragile place. I'll leave you with this, with this image. Um, uh, Aldous Huxley wrote a beautiful, desert, a, a beautiful essay called The Desert, just simply The Desert. Um, and uh, it, it ends with, with this astonishing image of the desert quivering in the springtime, just literally quivering. Um, uh, the choya cactus, he describes choya cactus is starting to move in the early morning light. And uh, it, it, ultimately what, what it was, it was uh, larvae, the larvae of, of uh, butterflies. Um, and so that image in the desert uh, I, I got to see with, uh, with the class that Doug uh, and I te teach um, one morning, uh, two years ago in the Mojave. We got to see precisely what Aldo Sekhli had seen 50 years before us. And the desert can be a place of emergence and beauty, um, but it's so absolutely fragile, and, uh, and we need to tend to it uh, for it to survive, for us to survive. So, with that, I'll, I'll close my remarks, and, and, and thank you very much for, for coming in today, and I, I would love to entertain any uh, questions or comments you have about the, about the desert. Thank you. I have a question about your class. It sounds like your class actually goes to the desert, is that true? Yes, okay. yes, that's the centerpiece of the, the class. So is it a short class, and is it an intensive class, and you go there at some point, or how does that work? It's a semester class, so, okay. uh, yeah, uh, and, uh, the, but the, the cornerstone of it is definitely uh, the trip into the Mojave. It's a weekend trip. And uh, we've uh, uh, kind of have a wrap down now. Uh, we first take the kids, many of whom have never been in the, in the actual desert, or have never been camping even. Um, we take them first to uh, Joshua Tree National Park, to uh, an official campsite. Uh, we actually, the first time we did it, we went straight into the wilderness and. and too much. We, they survived. <laughs> but it was a little bit too much like a, like, you know, a survivor episode. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we lead them gently into the, the, the more, you know, like urban desert of an official campsite with, you know, uh, electric light in the bathrooms at night and, you know, a lot of propane. And, and then the next night we go out into the Mojave National Preserve, which is all, uh, almost all rustic camping. And, um, uh, and the, the stars out in the Mojave National Preserve, and we've been lucky. Uh, we've had completely clear nights the last two years in a row, and uh, so it's, it's it's an amazing it's an amazing experience. It, and uh, I, as an interdisciplinary course, it's it's really opened my eyes to like the the, the tremendous possibilities of team teaching. Um, and there's something about the pilgrimage to the desert that it just made these teaching this class uh, by far the most rewarding experience in my teaching career, and I've been teaching for 20 years, and it's just really been transformative, as, <laughs> as we say. Uh -huh. Thanks for asking about this. So I'm curious about um, kind of how your relationship has changed. I mean, obviously you left, you came back to Los Angeles. You, I mean, it's if, I, if my timeline is is correct, you. It, Left yes. about the same time that your your twins were born. Yes, and, exactly. Um, so, how has it changed? They were conceived in New Mexico, in the okay. desert. Yeah. So <laughs> they were born here. <laughs> so, having summer. children and how has that kind of changed your relationship and how you you think about it or how you've introduced them to the desert? They're you know they're of an age now. They where they so know the desert because yeah. uh, Grandma's in the desert. She's in Albuquerque. Okay. Uh, so they're, they're defi they definitely know it. Um, and the we just in the, our house it's a desierto, you know. Um, 
and and you know their their origin myth they have it down you know when we go to Albuquerque there's the hospital you know where you know uh, we would we, we first saw them on ultrasound and stuff like that uh, so uh, and and these journeys it's a, it's a two day you know uh, car trip to Albuquerque we, we don't some people do it in a day but it's you know it's fourteen hours fourteen hour drive uh, so we do it in two days so already they're getting the sense of you know all the preparation that goes into we're taking the big trip into the desert, you know, uh, uh, and you know at this age, you know the impressions uh, 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 left. I think you know um, they're going to be big for them, um, and uh, and I ham it up, of course, also a lot, uh, you know, to, to make it even even bigger. Hopefully, you know, in their in their imaginations, I think. But um, uh, they they know the dif the difference of, of the landscape. They're very they're very uh, very aware of it. Um, my own relationship with desert has. I yearn for it a lot because I'm, I don't get a chance to go out there very often now. I, I talk about it in the city, you know, this is my relationship with the desert, is talking about it, imagining it a lot. Um, uh, in presenting the book, you know, I, I was in uh, uh, Albuquerque and Santa Fe, of course, and we'll be going to Arizona soon in West Texas. Um, and uh, it's, it's a place that, that continues to call me just as powerfully as, as, it, as it ever has. Um, and, that, and I, I imagine myself retiring there, you know, one day. I don't know if that'll come to pass, but uh, but I, I still have. I, I haven't ever, I haven't really gotten rid completely of the romantic notions of going out there. Um, and, in, and and when I first started this project, I think I, I, I began it in a much more radical vein. Um, I, George, I might I, at some point George O'Keefe might have been my enemy. You know? um, I, and, and I thought, you know, in a, in a kind of radical way, that we got to tear down, we got to tear these canvases down. They're keeping us from seeing the human figure on the landscape. But over time, and, and especially, I think, influenced, I, I reread Orientalism. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Edward Said's point was not to say this is. This are, he was saying these are racist representations, but he was also saying this is great literature and art. So, is there a way to like kind of like, be aware of the problematic representations and still accept the beauty and uh, and, and brilliance of the representation? And I think there is, and I think that's what Edward Said really does in the end. Right? Uh, and so I, I think I've come to make a sort of peace with the, the romance of the desert, uh, and I'm able to hold the the mystical and romantic desert. Alongside the material desert that is so fraught, and indeed, I think that um, that by doing so, ultimately, uh, that's the way that I'm going to arrive at the most beautiful desert. Yes. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. Uh, first and foremost. And um, I think what I, what I heard during your presentation is that um, a hint of the symbiotic relationship between the deserts here in the, in the Southwest and the deserts um, elsewhere in the world, in particular the Middle East, when you were talking about sure. military bases here. Absolutely. Um, just wondering, kind of in your musings, where that, what the extent of that relationship is, um, especially in terms of the conclusions that you drew towards the end of your, uh, your presentation tonight? Well, what, what connects the deserts is, is, is colonialism, or the, the neo, uh, N-E-O part of it, right? <clears throat> uh, the fact that uh, uh, the, the extreme poverty, uh, the way race and class dance in the desert together, uh, the drugs, uh, and the fact that, you know, poor whites and poor people of color uh, by and large, are the ones that are training on, on that base in 29 Palms and being sent overseas to fight other poor people of color. Um, you know that that was never that, that was never lost on me. Of course, I mean what unites the, the, the ultimately. I, 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 I once again invoking Edward Said. You know, I, I, I did turn to Said at a certain moment in this process, and and thought that well, you know, uh, uh, there this is kind of like a, an American version of Orientalism. Uh, what we have in terms of the artistic representations of uh, being at the service of colonialism uh, and distracting us from 
the, the work of colonialism, you know, putting up, you know, a, a beautiful kind of uh, a wallpaper or veil mm -hmm. through which it's difficult to see the, the actual machinery of, 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 of colonialism. Um, and, uh, and, and just the fact that the bombs are falling, you know, and the house is shuddering uh, on that landscape uh, tells me that uh, the longest wars the United States has been, has been involved in. Um, so, once again, you know, desert America, you know, America, uh, the, the, the emptiness uh, in the American soul uh, to the extent that it hasn't come to terms with its, its own colonial uh, ghosts, you know, and the, and the ultimate contradiction, of course, of kind of, you know, uh, uh, American exceptionalism just, you know, uh, uh, being the veil through which we cannot see uh, that you know, our mythology of us as colonial, colonial subjects unshackling ourselves of, you know, the colonial uh, power then proceed to enact colonial projects on the rest of the world and continue to do so, uh, including uh, the drug war. So, uh, yes, the desert functions in, in that way. Have you been to Manea, excuse me, Manzanar? I, you know what, became, I have not. Since it became a, a national not. park, I was there last yes. weekend. And oh, wow. I think it should be a pilgrimage for every American to go to. It is just north of Lone Pine. It's an easy one-day trip up and stay a night and come back. And it, it is just very spiritual. It's what we did as primarily white Americans to the uh, Japanese Americans, who most of which were born here, and just as much American as those of us who are white and so I mean, and that's also a desert juxtaposition because they were shipped from their homes here up to this little patch of land in the desert. Absolutely. Thank you so much for mentioning that. Uh, I had been to Lone Pine a couple times when I was a kid. Uh, Mount Whitney being right right there in that area, but uh, Mount Snow is very close by as well. And uh, yes. Uh, it's become I, a national park, and they've done the best job of any national park I've been in. Excellent. Glad to hear that. Yes. It would fit in the theme of what you're Absolutely. Thank you for mentioning. So um, okay. I think we're, 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 we're approaching the, the time um, uh, for the end of this session. If there are no other questions, um, I really want to encourage um, everybody to, if you don't own a copy of the book already, to, to drop by and, and uh, feel free to purchase a copy. And um, I hope... Uh, Professor Martinez, that, that you're able to stay just for a of few course. more minutes to, to allow us to uh, mingle a little bit. But thank you so much um, to, for, for being here with us tonight. Thank you all for uh, joining us.